going to be exploring mental strength this evening, what it is, how to develop it, and why should we have it. I think that in the last two and a half years or so, uh, it has become quite clear to many that we do need to pay some conscious attention to our mental strength in order to be able to handle the challenges, the tests, which come from the outside world. And uh, I, for one, was surprised as I was growing up that how little attention people pay to their, their inner world, their inner mechanisms. We all have two lives in a way. We have the outer life of our family, our study, our career, and so on. But then there is also the inner life. That's the life of our thoughts, our emotions, our beliefs, our perceptions, etc. And I find that there's a, a huge imbalance between the two, that we have paid a lot of attention to our outer life and, and also to our physical health, which of course we must do, but relatively little to the inner world. And I believe as a result of that, we do have the stresses and the strains that exist in life today, uh, the problems in relationships, and so on. And so what can we do in order to build up our inner strength, our mental strength? And why should we do this? Well, the first thing I think to realize is that the quality of your life does influence, the quality of your mind influences the quality of your life. When the mind is strong, is stable, is steady, and is clear, then we're better able to understand ourselves. And therefore, we're better able to understand other people. And for this, we also have to look at how it is that we are living our lives. Now, generally, what I've observed is most of us try to control the life which is outside of us. So let's look at the simple model that here is me and over here is life. And life means other people, means situations and events. So we have the tendency to try to control those things, especially the people in our lives, believing that if I have that control, then I will feel secure, I'll feel content, I'll be happy. But of course, you cannot control life. You cannot control even another person. If you try to do that, then you do generate a significant amount of stress. But between me and life, there is my mind. So if my mind is in my control, then life is unable to stress me. This is really a big part of being able to conserve our inner strength, is to ask ourselves, where am I placing the attention, the energy of my mind? If my mind is consumed by what I do not like about life or about some person, then I will generate my own negative emotions, like stress, like anger, etc. But rather, if I am concerned with how I wish to respond to that, then I'm saving so much of my mental energy, my mental strength. And so some shifts in the way that we live are required in order to be able to build and increase our mental strength. I'd like to share one or two images with you. Let me see if I can just bring this one up. Okay, I think you can see this. So this is 
telling us about a very simple but very important formula. And so it's telling us that uh, our inner strength, which then manifests as resilience, is connected to two things. So one is the, the effort you make. In other words, the right thing you do to take care of your mind. Now, effort here could be, for example, building meditation into your daily life. Effort could be having silence moments, reflective moments through the day. So you're actually moving your mind towards that place of balance and peace. So by doing that, certainly we will be increasing our mental strength. But there's something else in the equation as well. And that is your inner strength or resilience is the effort divided by the waste that you may also be producing. And if I really want to build my mental strength, I need to pay attention to both of these things. Make more effort, but also uh, do less of the waste. In other words, do the right thing more and do the wrong thing less. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to reduce the waste? And what is the waste that we produce, which is then causing our mental strength to leak away? Well, a large amount of the leakage of our inner strength, our mental strength, is connected to thinking too much and to speaking too much. It's easier to control our words than it is to control our thoughts. So we may start with our words. So consider, for example, that if you are speaking to another person, if instead of using a hundred words to say something, can I say the same thing in, let's say, 60 or 70 words? Am I able to be more essenceful in my communication? If I pay that kind of attention to being more essenceful, to being more concise, or perhaps to be able to get to the point more quickly, then in this situation, I am saving the energy of 30 or 40 words. And that energy I save will begin to accumulate in my mind. And for those who practice meditation, we call that as the accumulation of the power of silence. Your mind is becoming more silent, more still, more serene, because I am now wasting less of its energy. And as a result of this accumulation of what we call as silence power, this will then manifest into other areas of your life. And you will find you have new strengths, new abilities, whereas before you lacked them. So, for example, you'll find you have the willpower to, to do or to not do something which you have been unable to manage so far. You'll find you have greater ability to tolerate a situation or a person, whereas before you used to maybe lose it or get angry. You have a greater ability to be patient whereas before you would get anxious, impatient, nervous, intolerant, and so on. So that's one thing for us all to experiment with in our own lives. Can I be more essenceful with the words I speak? And the second thing which is connected with being essenceful is can I be more economical also with my words? And that means to know what to say, when to say, who to say it to, how much to say. 
Now, think of the, uh, the money in your pocket. We all know how important it is to be economical, especially in these times. So if you see something in a shop and you want like it, you want to buy it, could be an item of clothing, for example. But before you buy it, you would look at the price tag. Would you not? And so this will then enable you to decide, am I ready to let go of these many pounds, dollars, euros in order to have this article? And you may even choose to shop around, find out the price in different places, or you may even wait if you know there is a sale coming up in a few weeks' time. So too, to be economical with your words means not just to say the right thing, but choose the right moment to speak and choose the right person to say it to, checking, knowing what is the mood and the mental state of that person. If we're able to do this, then there is less chance of us having to repeat ourselves or continue to have to explain ourselves to others, which is another waste of our mental energy. So economical and essenceful with our word energy. And also then the higher level is with our thought energy. And as meditators, as those on a, an inner journey, this is really the area that we need to work on and pay attention to. What am I doing with my thought energy? Am I thinking too much? Now, um, let's again look at some strategies which can help us to avoid falling into the trap of overthinking. So here are a couple of examples, a couple of um, metaphors which I have found very useful. And uh, one is to do with being a spiritual student, a student of self-awareness. So let's take a practical example. Uh, let's say there is a student sitting for an exam in a school hall. And in that exam paper, there is some slightly unusual question. And the student starts thinking, well, why is this question here? What was the examiner thinking when he or she wrote this question? Why is this question here? Now, during the exam, you have to answer the question, not question the question. And if you get busy in questioning, why is this question here? Then you waste your time. At that moment, the right thing to do is to answer the question. So too, it happens in life when one is self-aware or spiritually aware, you realize that life sometimes throws questions at you. Life gives you a little test now and then. And so what to do when life is testing me? I have not to question why this situation is happening. Why this person is talking to me in this way? Or why so-and-so is behaving in such and such a way? That may come later, but at that time, at that moment, in the heat of the moment, I have to answer the question and not question the question. And so what does it mean to answer the question? I have found in, in my life experience that the best answers are all connected to the application of virtue, which means in a particular situation, life is asking me to apply, for example, tolerance. In some other situation, I am being asked to apply patience. In another situation, I am being asked to practice forgiveness or to be very honest or to be determined. 
All of these are virtues. And if I make myself busy in applying the correct virtue according to the situation, then I pass, I answer the question, and I move forward. The sign of having answered the question and ham, having been victorious in that particular test is that I have moved through a situation with my self-respect intact, with my peace of mind and my happiness, my dignity still in my own hands. And the more we practice this, the better we be, become at it. A person may say, well, you know, I have no tolerance. I'm not a very patient person. Well, okay, but that's why we have these centers like inner space. Uh, if a person goes to a gym and works out for half an hour and says, well, I don't see my muscles becoming any bigger, it's a question of regular practice. You have to make it a discipline and go often. In much the same way, if I wish to apply, to develop and apply virtue in my life, in my relationships, it really is a question of practice, a regular practice, a regular application in my day-to-day -day life. Second example connected to this particular idea is uh, imagine a, a person walking along a road and in front of that person is a, is a boulder, some kind of rock. Now, what should that person do uh, to, go, to continue on his or her way? He should just maybe go around it or just jump over it and keep moving on. But what if he or she were to take out a hammer and start smashing that boulder into tiny, tiny pieces so that he or she can then walk over it? So if you saw that happening, you may think, no, oh, this person has just lost it. What is he or she doing why doesn't he or she just go around it or just climb over it and carry on? Much the same way, one of the habits we sometimes have is we hit a situation with the hammer of the question, why? Why did this happen? Why is she doing this? Why is he thinking like that? Why didn't they X, Y, Z? So it's like bashing the boulder with the hammer of the question, why, why, why? And through this, we waste a huge amount of our mental strength, and it makes us rather exhausted. So rather than asking this question, why, in the inappropriate place, simply move past the situation, jump over the boulder, and the phrase that we sometimes use is, don't say why, but just, just fly. Just fly over the situation. Do not pick an unnecessary battle here. So in addition to you know, learning some strategies, we also have to unlearn what we have mislearned so we can relearn what we should have learned. And hence the journey of spirituality, uh, certainly in my understanding, is a return journey. Let's look at one or two more ideas. I'm going to show you another, another screen here if I can. Okay, so this asks us, where are you? living from and this affects the amount of mental energy that is being used so generally speaking for you know, for most of us uh, we tend to spend our thought energy our the energy of our awareness in these two outer 
realms. Either we tend to be wrapped up in, concerned, consumed by, and lost in the things that I have to do. So I have to do my job, I have certain responsibilities, I have to phone this person, I have to go shopping and attend them at some meeting. So our thoughts tend to be revolving around the things that I have to do. Or they tend to be revolving around the things I have. What do I have? I have a nationality, I have family members, I have a culture, a religion, a race, a maybe a position, some status in an organization. So when we identify with what we do and what we have, this then creates this, this uh, slimy creature called ego, this shape-shifting creature called ego. And when we are living in the ego zone, when we identify with doing and having, necessarily we're going to have ups and downs in our emotions, and we're going to lose a lot of our mental strength. And you know how it feels, you know, when you when you're on an emotional roller coaster over a period of time, it's very tiring. And that's when a person feels I am stressed, I need a break, I just need to get out of here. Uh, so how can we avoid this happening? Well, as this diagram here is showing us that behind or with, within this having and doing realm at the very core is the being realm or the being zone. And the important thing is, can I live from here? The being zone is essentially my truest and my deepest identity. And that is my spiritual identity. And uh, I can't underline how important this is because beneath the layer of our emotions is our sense of identity. Now, generally, when we have difficult emotions, which cause loss of mental strength, we find ways to handle those emotions. And there are so many techniques. And yes, they are certainly helpful to some degree. But also, I would say, simply managing your emotions is a little bit like dealing with the symptoms and not the cause. The cause beneath the emotions is my sense of identity. According to the identity which I have, which I'm carrying around in my awareness, so will be the emotions I generate. And if my identity is wrapped around the things I do or the things I have, which generates the ego, all the emotions will be ego-based emotions. And so what to do is how can I step away? How can I step back from those ego identities and come back to my spiritual identity? I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, but I am. Let me see if I can bring up another, another slide here. Okay, hope you can see this. Um, yeah, this wasn't the one I wanted, but anyway, <laughs> what do you think this is? This is a this is a pharmacy somewhere in India. Um, now, if you needed a medication in a an emergency, you could have a problem. Somewhere in there is what you need, and this is just a representation of how people's minds tend to be stuffed full of unnecessary useless information 
often about the past uh, and sometimes worries about the future. So this is what I wanted to show you is a model which helps us to conserve our mental strength and a little practice which can be helpful with this. So here are some of the main areas in our lives in which we use our mental energy. So for many, work tends to be number one or number two. And uh, family tends to be the other one, number two or number one. And then there is also maybe hanging out with our friends, attending some social event and so on. Uh, perhaps some time for leisure activities. And some others and maybe some study and so on. So just a few of the areas in our lives and there could be many more where we are spending our mind's energy and generally for most people i would say especially in city life what tends to happen is that we jump from one to the other and to the other and it can end up looking a bit like this so now here I am at work, and now I have to go and take care of my family. And then my friends are calling me for some occasion that I need to go and study. Time for a little bit of leisure activity, back to work, do some more study, family responsibilities. A friend is getting married, something here, something there. You know, jumping about from one to the other to the other. And it ends up being like a monkey jumping around in the branches of a tree. Now, after a while, uh, a person living this kind of lifestyle will get tired, will experience some stress and maybe some burnout as well. Because the mind has no clear sense of direction. There's no coordination in how I'm using my mental energy. And so, of course, when this happens, uh, we may look to take some kind of medication or drug to make us feel better, which is great for the pharmaceutical industry, but there's actually no way to live. So what to do? What is missing in this model, which can make my experience of life more pleasant? So here is another model, and one that we would suggest is more effective, especially in these times when, you know, with the technology, we have more information coming at us all the time. And of course, as often been stated, we live in an uncertain world where unpredictability is very much the name of the game. Who knows what's going to happen in the next hour? let alone the next day or the next week. So the suggestion is that be at the very center of your life. So you still have all of these things. You have your work, your family, your friends, and so on. But be at the center of your life. And from there, take care of your life. So go to work, work well, excel, be the best you can, progress in your, your work, your career, but do not lose yourself in your work. Always return to you. Take care of your family. Love your family, fulfill your duties, your responsibilities, manage the relationships, but always return back to yourself. So even the roles we have in a family, they are roles. So you may be playing the role 
of a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, a son, daughter, etc. But still, you are more than your family role. And so we have to acknowledge and respect who I am behind my roles, my labels, my responsibilities. Be with your friends, enjoy their company, and participate in life, contribute to life. But again, uh, no other person can be a substitute for you in your relationship with yourself. And this is perhaps one of the important things to consider, that how is my relationship with my own self? Have I negated that? Am I negligent in building a good relationship with myself? Am I using somebody else as a substitute for me in my relationship with myself? And the truth, of course, is if I build a good self-relationship, then necessarily my relationships with others will also harmonize and become good. So leisure time, study, um, others, it may be travel, it may be health related. All of these are important. But what this second model is telling us is always come back to yourself. Now, what does it mean to come back to yourself? For that, we'll be doing just a little meditation in a moment, just to demonstrate how we can experience that. So the condition of the first model is chaos, and the second is self-control. So a suggestion would be a little tip in uh, how we can conserve our mental strength. Think about how you start the day. When you wake up in the morning, before you engage with life, before you engage with the world, before you engage with what's happening in the world or the news or the traffic or the, the weather, etc., before you get into deep conversation with anyone in the home or even on the phone, first engage with yourself. First be with yourself. Take a few moments just to dwell in the simple and profound thought I am a peaceful energy. I am a peaceful being. I am a peaceful soul. Just be in that thought. Just enjoy being in that thought. Even if it's just for three minutes or two minutes. The thoughts you have in the first few minutes of the day, they impact the rest of your day. That's why we have to be quite mindful, quite careful of how we are treating the mind first thing in the morning. Think, for example, of constructing a very tall building. You may go up 30, 40, 50 floors. But before you go up first, you have to go down and fix very firm foundations. If the foundations are not firm, a little earthquake or a storm, and the building may collapse. So too, the building of my peace of mind, the building of my resilience, the building of my happiness through the day can withstand the storms, the challenges, if I've done that work in the morning of just charging my inner battery, charging the battery of the mind, with a few minutes of meditation. And then during the day, uh, to do another mini meditation, and we describe this as traffic control for the mind. So imagine the cars in the street, uh, imagine the thoughts in your mind. How is the traffic of thoughts in the mind? Is it orderly? Is it coordinated? Is it flowing? Or are thoughts going in all different directions at the same time? 
Is there a traffic jam in the mind? Or am I able to think clear and straight? We know that when there is a traffic jam, it could be just one car parked in the wrong place, blocking a hundred other cars. So to one wrong thought, negative thought, wasteful thought, one useless thought can block the flow of my creativity, my happiness and my peace. So traffic control is a simple exercise where you just try and stop if you can physically for a few moments, two minutes, three minutes, just withdraw from the mode of doing you just come to the mode of being, and we will do this in a moment, to experience that inner peace and silence, which actually is the nature of every person. So I would suggest choose times which work for you, but perhaps something like 10.30, one mid-morning, maybe one mid-afternoon, 2.30 or so. And the important thing, if this is new for you, is you try to do it every day. Experiment for one week. And see how you feel at the end of that one week. And often people report that they feel much more calm. Their thoughts are more ordered. And they are shifting from the mode of reacting, which is great energy loss to the mode of responding. So when I react to something or someone, I'm literally out of control. But when I'm responding, then I see what's happening, I hear what's happening, I understand, and I choose my expression. I choose how I wish to deal with it, what I want to say, when I want to say, if I want to say. And so when we're living in the response mode, we are conserving and managing our mental energy. And the wastage is very little if I can keep myself in the response mode. So let's do this then. Let's have a, a little meditation to just experience some of these things which I've been mentioning. And if it's new for you, um, I'll just suggest you try to minimize all distractions. Make sure your phone is away from you. Try to have your back straight. If you can, have your feet flat on the floor, or you may wish to sit cross-legged if you prefer that. The principle is that the body should be comfortable and also alert and should not distract the mind as we practice this simple reflection, this simple meditation. So I'll speak out a few guiding words and just follow as best as you can. So let's take these next few minutes. to relax the body and to relax the mind. The world outside of me is the world of sound, the world of action. It is the world of doing. And I cannot control the world outside of me. But there is also a world inside me. It's the world of my thoughts, of my feelings, of my experiences. And this world is in my own hands. And so let me experience 
the peace and the calmness of my inner world. And I start by asking myself, who am I? Behind the roles I play every day, who am I? Behind the labels I carry, who am I? Behind the masks I wear, who am I? There is more to me than these roles, these labels, these masks, these responsibilities. And when I look in the mirror, I see the reflection of my face, my body, but there is more to me than just this. And so let me bring my attention up towards my face. and up to the center of my forehead. And here at the center of the forehead, just behind the eyes, I picture a beautiful star of peaceful light. Just visualize this wonderful radiant star in the center of the forehead. the star of peaceful energy. This is me. This is I, the living energy the soul. I am not what I do. I am not what I am. I am this peaceful being of spiritual energy, a soul. Deep inside, I, the soul, there has always been a reservoir of inner peace. And this peace is my deepest and my truest nature. And 
now, I choose to re-emerge this peace once again. What I have to do is just to be aware, to be aware I am peaceful spiritual energy, I am light, I am a soul. And I am free. Be with this feeling of peace in your mind for one minute. 